All right, at 6.30, I'd like to call the meeting to order, verify compliance with open meetings law, and adopt the agenda. Could please stand and join me in the pledge flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. 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 Item three is comments from the audience regarding agenda items. This is the only time audience members may comment on current agenda items during this business meeting. As a reminder, comments can only be made about items listed on the agenda for this meeting. Before addressing the board, please state the agenda item number that you are discussing, your name and your address. You may speak for a maximum of five minutes. Any comments tonight? Okay, seeing none. Move on to item four. Uh, we have nothing for <coughs> gifts and donations and recognition tonight. So then item five is consent agenda. Uh, the consent agenda items are approved all at once and are one meeting approval items. 5A is the approval of July vouchers <coughs> and vouchers payable. 5B is the approval of June 26th and July 10th school board meeting minutes. 5C is approval of personnel recommendations. And 5D is approval of early graduation requests. Would anyone like to remove an item? Okay, motion to approve items A, B, C, and D. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Seeing none, motion carries. Item six is reports and discussion. Uh, so <coughs> the first stop is facilities planning ongoing discussion with Bray. Good evening. Good evening. Oh boy. Good evening. That's a lot of paper. Quinn would like oh, three. Yes. Quinn wants more paper. <laughs> Quinn would like three, please. Yeah. Just to lay them all out around. You had to be a. Yeah. Look at that. Something's dead. <laughs> more than something. Full <laughs> force. So first, thank you for the opportunity to be in front of you. Uh, what we wanted to do tonight is basically give you part one of what will eventually be the full, complete study effort. Okay, and so uh, if you remember back to when we started the process, on, we can had... I, can you just introduce yourself again since it's being recorded for yep. anybody that's... Fair enough. Yep, Michael Hacker with Bray Architects. Thank yep. you. Thank you. Uh, sorry. Yep. Um, when we started the uh, study process, we have talked about kind of two concurrent studies going on. The first piece is the infrastructure component, and the second piece is really focused on the academic uh, elements, okay? And so um, what we're here tonight to talk about is the two elementaries in the middle school uh, infrastructure um, components, okay? And you can see uh, there's quite a bit of information here just in those three buildings alone on just the infrastructure. So what we decided to do was basically break these into two parts. So the first part would be uh, uh, this, and then in two weeks we're going to come back and present the infrastructure at the high school, and then talk about some of the bigger picture academic components that tie the district together, <coughs> if that makes sense to everybody. So um, I, I think this document can be presented page by page, and there's a lot of information here. But the reality <coughs> is this is really tonight the, the goal is to hand this off to you and allow you to start to dig through this in, in more detail, so that when we come back in two weeks, uh, we can provide you kind of an executive summary of it and then ultimately answer any questions that you might have. Okay, so what I thought I'd do is quickly just tell you what to expect when you start to dig through this. Okay, and so what we've done is organize the tabs by building. Okay, so just as an example, if you were to flip to tab one, what you'll see is Edgerton Elementary School. <coughs> and we always start out with an introduction. So that first page just gives you a summary of what the school is. Again, this effort is really to objectively just document who you are as a district from an infrastructure standpoint. Okay, and so we always start with um, the total building area of 56,000 square feet, total population of 452 students. We're on about six acres. We give you the grade configuration and a little more detail about, about parking. Okay, again, just a snapshot of, of who you are uh, kind of from, from that building's perspective. <coughs> the next page, you'll see it as labeled page 10. It's the first pullout um, uh, 11 by 17 sheet. That gives you an evolution diagram of the building, okay? And that evolution diagram just gives you kind of the history of that facility, so what portions were built originally, and then from there, what subsequent additions were added on. We'll give you, uh, you'll find existing site and existing floor plans, 
and we've gone ahead and, and labeled those per how they were used this last school year so you can kind of get a handle on what grades were, were located where and then obviously how you used each of the different spaces in the building. Then we get into the really exciting stuff, which is the engineer's reports. And so there you'll see plumbing, HVAC, electrical, every system, um, a, a uh, analysis of, of what you have in the building, an observation of how that's functioning, whatever that system may be, and then ultimately a recommendation on uh, what to start to plan around. Okay, And a lot of that you'll see does correlate to recent investments and investments in past referendums or past major projects throughout the district. So again, if you had uh, replaced a boiler in the mid-90s, um, you'd see that about 20 years, fast forward 20 years to where we are today, the life expectancy of that system is starting to fail. So it's not, you'll see in their recommendations around how to start to plan around some of those improvements. Okay, and the goal there, I think, First and foremost is to give you a document that you can start to plan around uh, from, from a long-term capital improvement standpoint. But then as we start to talk about architectural solutions and, and potential future referendum dialogue, this gives us a framework of what we need to assume within those projects. Okay, So quite a bit of detail in the engineer summaries. And then lastly, architectural, we uh, take a look at the infrastructure of the building, the envelope. Uh, we look at the doors and the windows. We talk about the roof in the building. Um, kind of give you a snapshot of, again, what condition those are in and, and give you some recommendations around that. And then uh, last within the architectural component is the, an ADA analysis of, those, of each of the facilities. Okay, so we went through and documented where we have ADA compliance challenges currently. Um, and uh, ultimately, there you'll see that summarized um, in writing. And then we have some floor plans to help identify you know, some of those key areas. So you see, again, that's organized in the same structure for each of the three buildings. And again, when we come back in two weeks, what you'll see is, is the same structure, but for the high school. And then once we take a look at that, we'll also have some additional detail about some of the academic components that go along with uh, each of the facilities throughout the district. Okay. So I think um, at the highest level, what we wanted to do tonight was hand this off to you, kind of give you an intro to what to expect as you start to, to dig into that. But do know when we come back in two weeks, we'll have kind of a, a, an executive summary version of this, as well as be prepared to answer any questions that you may have at that point. So that's your expectation of us to take this and look at this and... At whatever level of detail you, you care to dive into it. Yeah, again, when we come back, what we're going to be doing is identifying um, We'll have a, a kind of a laundry list of the recommend, recommended focus needs, okay? It's not really our responsibility at this point in the <coughs> process to prioritize those. We'll talk with you a little bit more later about when we start to prioritize those needs district-wide. All we're trying to do is catalog and inventory them. Right. And that's kind of, this is the, the kind of detailed portion of that. <coughs> really, the only part that's up for discussion is your observation as to replacement or... Uh, removal or let it stand because the other stuff is just <coughs> packed right or no correct yeah I, I would say when we start to make that analysis when we start to determine what should be demoed and what should stay that does correlate directly to what the solution is and, and ultimately um, the the cost impact mm -hmm. of different options right and so um, as we start to examine solutions moving forward we will look at you know, significant demo, we'll look at, you know, simple renovation. We're cognizant of, of the investments the district has made in each of the facilities recently, and we want to be sure to, to kind of respect those and make sure that we're obviously not reinvesting in those areas, if, if at all possible. And so, um, again, you'll see when we come back, uh, the needs, we'll organize those into infrastructure. We'll talk about safety and security. Um, we'll look at the site and some of the challenges we have on the different sites. And, help you to take this and kind of boil it down to kind of the, the main focus areas. So when you come back and we've got the high school listed in here, is there enough time to make sure that the recommendations are as current as possible given what we've done throughout <coughs> 32 through July or June 30th that that'll reflect that information? I'm confident in that. Okay. Yep. Because yep. actually, Mike, you're coming this next <coughs> week again. Their engineers are on site, so it yep. will be very current in terms of what work has been done. So they're not right. using old engineering information. Okay. They're actually their engineers are coming again 
This week, next yeah, week? Yeah, Thursday. This week, this Thursday. This Thursday. So, I mean, in, ta in terms of any work that's been done this summer and planned for it, that will be included in their observation and their final piece of it. Good. Yeah. And you say, you know, some challenges we may have. Do you mean if we just stand pat and don't build anything or if we are looking to build something? Yeah, so this is really identifying the challenges you have today. Currently. So this is not the solution. Yep. So this is really just to say, again, if you do nothing moving forward, this is, goes into your records in terms of... Well, but, but, but then there are recommendations in there that this needs to be upgraded or this needs to be removed, mm -hmm. whatever. Correct. Yep. Yeah, the identified as our, code... As our facilities <coughs> stand now. Today. Correct. Yep. So, it, 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 and I think that's true, Mike. This creates a, a, a very thorough mm -hmm. <laughs> facilities document that, you know, we hadn't seen yet up until this point, um, and that's why we wanted to be comprehensive, include all four buildings on top of it, not just one of those, because what we choose to do from here on out is really where the crux of the conversation happens next. So by having that high school piece, because I think um, originally we didn't have that piece um, as part of that, and I think as we're looking at priorities and solutions in terms of that, I think that that's critical to have it all, to say that we've not left any stone unturned, as you keep hearing me say throughout this whole process, that we're exploring everything possible. And I think that it's critical to have that. So, um, Mike, I'm just going to share a conversation we had last week in terms of with school perceptions and that, because I had sort of shared with the board. So we had met... Friday morning. Friday, did we? Yep. Yeah, Friday. Mm -hmm. We had a, a conversation with school perceptions talking about the next uh, survey piece of it and what that would include. So I think after the August... 14th date of the high school piece of it in the conversation with the board and seeing that laundry list we would have between that date and when we decide the survey would be so like a month or so to have some conversations <clears throat> I think that that's really the the key uh, conversation about um, where the community would prioritize the needs so I think that you'll see the list of needs in terms of all of that and then I think the work that the board has to do is deciding um, what of those items are critical items that can't be covered in the regular operating budget? What need to go out to referendum to, to get done? And then letting the, the community input determine the priorities of those things that need attention to. And that's, that's what that second survey in terms of talking with school perceptions and Bray really provided for us on Friday <coughs> what the next step is. So. Right, really trying to look at the district and all the needs and solutions as a master plan. You know, knowing that we may or may not be able to solve all of them in one capital effort, in one referendum effort, but we need to start to plan around all of them. So really it provides us a structure and, and kind of a comprehensive list of all those needs. So as we start looking at solutions, we can prioritize and make a game plan for, for how we're going to move forward as a district, solving all those challenges. Any other questions tonight? Okay. Thank you for coming tonight. Yeah. Thanks for putting this all together. And then um, we'll see you on the 14th. 14th. Sounds great. Yeah. And just in terms, I think, as I shared with the board, but I wanted to um, share you know, with the public that this, uh, Mike, this is, there's a PDF document for this that we're going to share with our there is. <laughs> community. <laughs> so if someone wants to give their hard copies back, right. that's fine. But um, So we're going to share with the community a PDF of this document because it is very comprehensive. There is no way that you could read this in one sitting. So it will have all of the pullout options and all of that. Um, share that um, so people can just start to see it. it. It is what it is, and I think as Quinn stated, it's facts. It's not mm -hmm. a matter of so people can actually see and get a very in-depth look at, at, at from the engineering standpoint, the ADA standpoint, the facility, some history. It's a great document even to have from a historical <coughs> standpoint to have it all collected in one piece of it. So we will be sharing that with the public um, as soon as we, uh, in terms of what this looks like, because I know it's hard if you're looking at this not seeing what the document is in front of you. So we'll be sharing that with. All right, thank so, you very much. So when I'm reading this, and I see, you know, you got one, building entrance, and then there's <coughs> one eight that tells me, <coughs> like, what you found out about that, whether it's, like, five, five is maneuvering, thresholds, push and pull, and then you have what's, what we have, and then you have five A, B, and C, and then it says these, these, there are areas where requirements, thresholds, do. so that's where that A, B, or whatever is going to be, where it's going to suggest, or state if it's compliant if it's not if it's correct. run down if it's correct it's way out if it's in great shape yep so what you're referencing right there is the ada compliance sheet so what okay. that is is a list of all the 
items we look for when we do a general okay. ADA review, and then on the subsequent page you'll see uh, a floor plan where we identify where we have those specific challenges throughout the building. Okay. okay. So. Good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. <clears throat> okay. Item 6A is a glance at achievement data, the ACT and Whitnall High School graduate <coughs> survey. So we talked last time about um, the Redefining Ready report card, a district scorecard, what that looks like, and starting to look at some data. So we thought it would be helpful if we started to chunk out some of the data to look at ours, and we thought um, in terms of providing the board that we're still collecting our AP historical data. So two pieces of data that we're just going to briefly look at. Again, it's not decision making, but in terms of getting the board caught up to speed and getting a little bit more working knowledge with what we're talking about. Um, we're going to look at both ACT data <coughs> historically and our recent ACT data that we got back. So some of it's a new look um, in terms of the 2017. Um, and then um, it had been, we um, gathered the um, graduate survey that we had talked about before. You'll see um, that that's shared in there. We can talk about that a little bit um, and what historically has been done. Um, we are still waiting a little bit from that, and I'll talk a little bit more on that in terms of getting some historical all-in-one instead of just some um, hard copy survey. So, um, do you need <coughs> to, I can advance I it if you want. Mm, do we have this in our packet? Well, it's, in it. it's in the folder. It's in the folder, that ACT folder. So we want to see you, though, in terms of camera, you can't be seen. Okay. So, yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, you can. Which document is this that you have on the screen? Uh, this is the it's in a whole folder of ACT. I data. have that. Yes, yeah, there's order. several okay. documents in there, and I'm yeah. just asking which one yeah. he's got. Up. The WHS historical ACT average score. Benchmark score. Okay, so basically this spreadsheet kind of gives us a historical perspective on how our students have achieved in each area of the ACT as well as the composite and the specific percentage of the student population in terms of ACT readiness. Now those readiness scores, as we all know, the ACT <coughs> is based on scores from zero through 36. Um, that one document that was entitled ACT Benchmarks kind of gives you guys the, the norm of where students fall. So for example, English is at 18. So even though 36 is the highest a student can score, ACT determines a score of 18 or higher, the student is college, has hit that college readiness mark. So pre-2014-15 school year, um, the ACT was strictly optional. Whoever wanted to take it, as we know, it was a major criteria for getting into any four-year university <coughs> as well, and, you know, continuing education. Um, however, the state, in its mission to make sure all students are college and career ready, you know, mandated that every student needs to take it. And you can certainly see that in that first column there um, in terms of enrollment and percentage of students tested. Um, we went up on average 26% of our student population that normally wouldn't take the ACT is now being forced to take it. <coughs> and statewide, that, that was felt. As you see on average there in the composite, the, it dropped roughly about two full points. Um, so needless to say, the scores in each area, as well as the composite, are a little lower, but they're staying steady because historically, if you look throughout the composite, and we have to decide what we're really looking at here, this is a wealth of data, and this is just scratching the surface. We can get in, you know, really dive down in each individual sub-area, and within the math scores, there are certain other skills that we can drill into too. So, Right now, this is just, like I said, a surface view and kind of the trends, and that's why I did the, the average, the mean, from historical mean to <coughs> the pre-2014 mean, and then the post mean as well in all those areas. Um, so if you want to go, could you go to the, um, sorry, I have a lot of tabs um, up top here, the mean tables right there. <coughs> So right here is where I kind of broke it down to make it a little bit easier to read and follow. Um, so up there, um, the differentials between the pre and the post um, is kind of what I wanted to point out. And once again, 
that level of participants going up the, the 26 percent and obviously the negative correlation um, with a lower percentage of students reaching that readiness benchmark. Um, if you go further down, um, the historical means between the, the pre um, the pre mandated ACT and the post mandated ACT, our numbers are actually higher in the post um, when it's mandatory, but all that's really saying is that our traditionally our students that wouldn't take the ACT are stronger than those <coughs> students traditionally that wouldn't take it around the state. That's essentially the conclusion we can reach there. Um, so, let's see if there's oh, and then if you go to the area high school ACT <coughs> college readiness benchmark. Um, so this was created in October of 2016 using the 2016 um, ACT score. So it, this would be the class that just graduated their ACTs. Um, so um, all uh, district assessment coordinators at the time, Tony Brzezowski sent this to me, and students that wanted to contribute to this Google Doc, um, you know, that chose to, those were the ones that on it. I left it on there for about a month, and that those were the final nine schools that contributed to it. So we are currently sitting right there second from the bottom in terms of overall percentages. But once again, these are the schools that only chose to share it. We have no idea where we fall in line with the other area schools. But also it's, it's valuable information as well. Um, for example, what is Pewaukee doing? What, what is their curriculum look at? These are questions we can start answering and looking into as we go through the, the data. So at this time, I mean, questions, that's pretty Brian, much. Brian, do you have like what percentage of our students met like 18 as a percentage, like 38%? Is that, did I miss that in a chart? Like out of, if 18 is the college readiness score. How many scored English, above 18 and above? Yeah. Because um, in terms of the redefining ready um, report card, they've sort of looked at that. Like, you know, did 80% of our students get 18 or above or what does that percentage look like? And I know we, that's not a typical way of looking at it, but maybe I've, yeah, at, uh, can you go back to that initial um, Google Sheets, please? Yes, and then can you scroll to the right, please? Yep, percent that met benchmark score in English. Um, so I have the high school in the state there. So 77% of our students got an 18 or higher in English, and then on down the line. And finally, um, if I'm just going off of this year's most recent data, um, the, the final one at the end, is met all four benchmarks in all four areas. So our certified college and career ready in all areas of the ACT. 24% uh, of our students hit that mark this year. So Lisa, are you thinking that that would be a more appropriate thing to center a goal around? Right, so I think I want to, right, it? I asked Ryan to share, because uh, he had been working with it for a couple of years now, in terms of different ways of looking at it, because there's the composite ACT, there's looking at it compared to the state, there's looking at it to local area school districts, there's there's a lot of different ways in terms of how we look at it. For example, this year's juniors <coughs> moved up point one point in our composite, but so did the state. So we seem to keep pace with where the state did in terms mm -hmm. of ours, but that doesn't necessarily, I mean, is that okay? Are we expecting to... Um, you know, when you added 26%. So I think one of the interesting facts that Ryan shared was that the students who weren't previously taking it and that are, pre are taking it now are doing much better than those in the states that didn't take it before. So that's an interesting piece which speaks to the whole student body differently because you'll see some school districts that added those that weren't taking it significantly drop their ACT score because there was such a gap between so what that means is there may not be as big of gaps in terms of some of those things. There's a lot more analysis we can be doing, but I guess the question really becomes what it is that we want to put out there. Are we just trying to look at the ACT composite, or are we trying to use what's called that college readiness by saying if ACT is doing the data, and I think John referred to it as sort of reverse engineering it, um, and telling you consistently the data is showing that that's the score that show that students um, are graduating from college <coughs> and are successful. Are those more critical pieces? Do they provide us more detailed information or implications for English, math, science versus just a composite score? Um, so it does dig down a little bit deeper and allows our, our teachers to have a little bit different types of conversations than maybe they have in the past. So. 
And as, as a staff, um, we, <coughs> we do have an Achievement Data Council that does go over this. Um, there's representatives from each department. Um, I, we kind of look over the, the data as a whole. I send it out to them. And then those members, we kind of get together and talk and decide you know, what we want to look at. Um, there was kind of some dr drafting of ideas as far as are we just going to lay all this data out in front of the staff because then it's going to become overwhelming because these files are, you know, enormous. Or, and furthermore, the more important question, does our staff really know how to ana analytically look at data? Have they been taught? Some of us have and some of us have not. So we started this year to draft kind of a questionnaire to have teachers ask themselves these questions as they go through kind of the surface data and we broke it down by departments and by skills within those subject areas and even also breaking down the readiness levels of those students that took the ACT Aspire, which we all know correlates directly to the mandatory ACT testing um, that students take every <coughs> spring. The first year it was taken, it was in fall and spring, which I wish we kept doing because we could measure that growth within the freshman year. Uh, but certainly those Aspire scores too are very beneficial in seeing, proje projecting where that student may end up. And kind of those students that are um, red, as we call it, in need of improvement, yellow, kind of on the fence and green and kind of we were talking about this year those yellow kids those kids that just need that little extra push to get in the proficient proficient range how can we reach those kids how long has the achievement data council been around uh, I would say roughly would you say Jackie two years now Yeah, second year, second year. so um, <clears throat> what are do you have any examples of goals or tasks that you set up last year based on the ACT information um, that you use throughout the year to build <coughs> into the curriculum? Or? This year we had the, the um, idea of establishing action plans um, with, with what the departments felt they could <coughs> influence within their classrooms and within the curriculum and a lot of the staff chose to implement the you know, practice questions at the beginning of every lesson and whether or not that was fulfilled or not. Um, during tests, are they taking actual, fitting it in within the unit but pulling from the you know, past examples of ACT questions, mm -hmm. are they integrating that into those tests? And I know for a fact science has been doing that. Math has been doing their um, warm-up activities as ACT prep questions that correlate with the unit. So they're really trying to embed it in the unit. I guess the area that we, the jury's still out on is, is there specific prep that our students need to be doing, a prescribed course, or, you know, in our, or is that too, you know, are we pigeonholing our kids saying that, here you're going to take this direct instruction ACT course when we're focusing on personalized learning and differentiation of learning styles because as we all know with the ACT you know you don't want the kids to study what they already know so there's kind of those questions that we got to sift through and find out what's important and the best way to go about preparing our students for this. So has there been any discussion about the ACT prep or changing it because I know that there's a company that comes in and offers courses. So does this also encompass some analysis of that as to whether or not we need This is not inclusive. Okay. So this is not, this is broad versus looking individually at kids. Yeah, and with the Naviance program, it, I think roughly when talking with um, Jim Krolikowski, or Dean of Students, kind of oversaw the program, um, by the end of the course, they've essentially taken the ACT roughly seven times. Um, and it, it gives them reports on what areas they obviously excelled at and then kind of provide some questions that they routinely struggled on, so building upon those skills. And, and one thing to, um, you know, in these past three years um, with, the, with the mandatory ACT, what I'll keep in mind that a lot of these students, this is the first time they're encountering it, and they're using it as a, a practice test because they know they'll probably be taking it two or three more times, and as studies show, the more times you take it, on, I think on average they say you, you jump two to three points. So a lot of times this is the first time our students are encountering encountering it and a lot of this data is reflective of only those school scores. Do we have any uh, any data that breaks it out by how many times that students have taken the test? Like can we say all, do we have any data that says okay these are the scores for all first time takers, these are scores for all second time takers? 
I believe the, with the more frequency the student takes it, um, and any of you that know this better than I can correct me, I think it, um, I think it takes their highest score and it aver averages it, not the most recent. I just wonder if we have any, any data like this. We this. were not tracking it based no. on the number of times. They reported the guidance. Do we have the ability <coughs> to track that? Is that data provided to us to be able to break it out? Well, if they're paying for it on, on their own, I don't know if they see. Are we a testing center, Jackie? We are a testing center. If you're a testing center, you should get the CD every time that the, it's taken here. And so you have to, if you input, if you up, upload it every time it's taken, then you would have it in IC in terms of that. So the John, John, the answer is yes, short term. We're not currently doing it that way, it. but it could be. Yeah. We're not looking at it, but with the data is provided to us. We could look at it that way as an option, yep. <clears throat> so we, are we teaching to take the test? Teaching to take the test? I think they're teaching <clears throat> the strategies and the skills and the content needed, but I mean in terms of... So like, if, you score, if you score a 27 on an ACT, are you uh, a well-rounded kid? That's a great question. I, don't, that's a, I think that's more of an op opinion. It sounds like we're teaching to do good on a test. And, and if we are doing that, do kids learn? Do kids comprehend for long term? I think those are obviously very, I mean, a very good questions in terms of what we want to look at. How much merit do we want to base mm -hmm. on the ACT and how, how much of our district goals do we want to focus on this test? Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, we look at the numbers. Everybody wants mm -hmm. to put a number and that's what counts and that's what gets printed. Mm -hmm. We go back to our Redefining ready college go. and crew readiness. Yeah, that, yeah. I'm, I'm not yeah. smart here. I'm just trying to remember. No, you are. And and so why are we getting beat up by Japan and China? Because they don't teach the scores. They teach for to, to think outside to think. I'm, not, I'm sure I'm not putting it to you, but I'm sure we're not changing this overnight either. But I also don't think that the teachers are teaching to the test. They think that what they've tried to do is look to see in what we are teaching and what our curriculum calls for, can we incorporate within that? So if, um, if there's a lot of questions that refer to graphs on the ACT test, can we make sure that on every unit we ask that type of question so that kids have the skills and they're prepared to look at a graph and answer that question, but using our curriculum as, as the base? Yeah, I mean, there's no way if we would make the decision to say, we're going to change. <clears throat> well, none of our kids would get accepted at college, right? I don't know. I think, I think overall post-secondary institutions are becoming a lot more holistic, and I think that's part of what we need to spend a little bit more time doing right now. I think we haven't done that to really talk to our post-secondary institutions to figure out what it is that they're do what they're looking at from an application I think we put a lot of <coughs> emphasis on that and I think people might be surprised that they look a little bit broader than what we think obviously an ACT score is an easy way of trying to look at some data but I think they're also trying to be a little bit more holistic in what they're looking at that makes a student successful and I think that's where this whole redefining ready is coming from is they're saying it's not just a test score what are some other skills because there's also a lot of research no offense to anybody but that the valedictorian isn't always your most mm -hmm. successful person afterwards if you're looking at things like entrepreneurship or some of the other things in terms of that they're very compliant because that's part of what the system is taught. So I think that in all of that it is the well-rounded piece um, and I don't know that there's trade-offs for one or the other. I would never say sacrifice one for the other. I mean obviously you have to look at both of those but I do think it's the conversation we're going to have to have because we can't holistically do everything like if, if we're going to say that our goal is to raise that and some districts do they put a lot of weight on whether whatever it is students taking an AP test a composite ACT that becomes a priority that's where we're going to have to have the conversations here about where because we can't do it all obviously and if we believe in a well-roundedness then we look at more things like does every graduate participate at least in one co-curricular activity because that creates a well-rounded piece of it or that they do 25 hours of community service or whatever that is that's the conversation. So this is a great starter. We didn't come tonight, if you noticed, with a recommendation. We wanted to gradually just, we'll put all of this data in a folder so we have it, but we will have to make some priorities in terms of where are we going to put it and where do we put our time and effort. 
um, in terms of you know what is our goal? Is it are we okay with where our composite score is in terms of what the community talks about? Are we okay with that if our students are getting? I guess the question really relies a lot, which you know John has talked about before, a postgraduate survey in terms of how are they doing? Are they successful? What are the things that we could have done better so they could have been more successful? I don't think a lot of them are going to come back. You should have given me a higher ACT score, honestly. It's going to be on things like collaboration, communication, <coughs> financial literacy, independent living, all of those things that we think we know. So I think that that's part of our journey this year in figuring out what that all of is and where we spend our time. Well, we were a district not too long ago. Our goal was to increase the ACT, mm -hmm. right? Uh, when I first came on the board, that yep. was the goal. Yep. By what, a point a year, or what was it? Uh, Jackie, do you remember? We originally had a goal of 26 and a half. Yeah. So, I, I'm sorry. And where were we when we started this goal? Oh, I have to look back. Mm -hmm. What, what, the board? 20, what year was it, Quinn? Yeah. What year was it, Quinn? Pardon? What year was it? I have no idea. Is, isn't that oh, number right up on the board good, there? Good three to four years ago. Oh. I think. Right. Number should be right up on the board. But anyway. Three or four yeah. years ago. Right. I'm just saying that we were. And sure. So I guess. If you do, remember, though, part of that goal was looking at um, <coughs> students as individuals and not, you know, understanding that, like, if I'm at, um, if I'm at a, a 15, my chances of increasing my score to a 23 and a half in a short period of time aren't very good and it's not realistic. And so a lot of our work revolved around. Um, we had fancy formulas for figuring out, you know, what would it mean for that student on a daily basis to improve, and that was when they were doing the explore and the plan, and then doing the ACT, and there was a little bit different scoring system, and that's how we were looking at individual students so that we could um, track that progress. So, uh, to Quinn's point about teaching the test and well-rounded students, I. I I see your point. I don't see any, I can't see how we would find correlation between a high ACT score and a well-rounded student. That's looking at like two different things. But one thing that, one way of assessing a, an applicant to a college that colleges look at is ACT score. But another thing from what I've seen lately and from what I've heard as well is, is uh, the well-roundedness, <coughs> you know, extracurriculars and that kind of stuff. The counselors uh, are, are trying to encourage, as I've seen, trying to encourage kids to take, uh, to get involved in different things, whether it's band or, or um, orchestra or, or, or some sports or things like that, working on the well-rounded part of it. But uh, I think the district also is serving the students by working on the ACT part of it. If they're, in order to improve scores, one thing that s students have done on their own, whether it's for medical college admissions tests or the MCAT or um, uh, ACTs or whatever, is they can take prep, uh, prep courses to improve scores, and many students uh, do. Uh, if, the, if the district is, is offering that or putting that in the curriculum, it seems like they're just trying to work on one more facet of the, the various uh, variables that, that uh, universities, colleges look at. Um, of course, in those prep courses, that is what they're doing, is they're teaching to the test. Um, you're trying to give students or, or uh, you know, people that are going to take the test um, techniques to uh, improve their scores. There are certain ways, I've, I've taken a, a few of these, and there's uh, tests, and there's certain ways to um, be able to speed up how you're looking at certain types of questions and how to analyze them and things like that. So uh, in a sense, teaching to the test, I mean, it depends. If you gear your whole math program, uh, math curriculum around <coughs> just targeting the improved ACT score for the math portion, maybe that's not quite appropriate. But making sure that you incorporate um, the skills that ACT tests in, in general as, you know, so you're not missing things, I think that would be appropriate. So we. We probably teach to the test some in certain ways, especially ACT prep type stuff. And that doesn't necessarily make a well-rounded student, but it does improve their chances of getting into the school they want. <coughs> okay. That's my opinion. Yeah, 
Yeah, so I don't think we'd sacrifice one for the other, but it's how much emphasis or are we saying that that's the only thing. I think that there's a lot of those career readiness things that typically schools haven't put out there and tried to benchmark to improve it. And that's where I think we're going to have some real dialogue around here in terms of what do we think it's important and do we want to make any of them a graduation requirement in terms of community service or whatever that might be or just sort of hope kids do that. How much effort do we want to spend on any of those things? So I think that's where the conversation will be. Is our plan at this point, I mean, your plan, whatever it is, we're going to start going and asking Pewaukee and Greendale and Sussex Hamilton, et cetera, what they're doing and try to compare it to what we're doing and see where the difference lies? I mean, is that one of our goals of what we want to do? Because I know you said those numbers were all self-entered, correct? Correct. So you can take it for what it's worth, but it's still kind of a gaping percentage that if they're obviously doing something, why not learn from it? And I can see with some of those schools on that list and just casually talking with administration yeah. at the other schools, it's either, you know, a prescribed <coughs> course that they're having, yeah. uh, that a lot of their students partake in, or um, prescribed ACT prep and homerooms, there are scheduled yeah. support periods that are built in within the day, um, particularly for their juniors leading up to the test. Um, so a lot of them have put their own spin on their own yeah. interventions within their own class or school schedules to make it work for their kids. Is the prep also all kind of sort of taught from a similar curriculum standpoint, like we all use this kind of same prep book and try to go off of that, or how is that, how does that compare what we do compared to what they're doing, I guess, just in general terms? I, 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 I can't answer that. I mean, I'm not sure which programs they're using, so without okay. knowing the program, I can't yeah. really compare it to what we have. Gotcha. Pewaukee is using Navion, so we did meet with them prior to um, purchasing the equipment. And they mm -hmm. run their minutes on the other um, folder of data that you have and this refers back to and Jackie feel free to jump in at any time So there's 2014, 2015 in there in terms of survey data. Um, take a look at one of these if you want to take a look at them. What Jackie is hoping to do is we need to contact <coughs> is to court, it's, it's used through the company school perceptions, which we've used through the referendum and continue to use. What we're hoping is they can give us the data files in an Excel format so we can use the data and give it into a historical context so we can see if there's any significant changes in things like overall satisfaction. Um, but this was in terms of what was asked about what is on the survey from graduates. Um, you can see the types of questions as far as, you know, how do you make your course selections? How do you feel the high school did in preparing you for some things? They do some, obviously they have some metrics in terms of the overall satisfaction rate. Um, you know, we, we don't require right now in terms of students to take it. So when you look at 148 of our students, considering we have 200 around two, from a graduating class, it's about 75% of our students just under that that take it. So there's a lot of questions in terms of, you know, moving forward with this data or this survey if we feel. So Jackie, this is taken in May, June. <coughs> when is this given? Yeah, After? Yeah. Okay. So. So in terms of that timing, I think you know we've talked a lot about trying to do follow-up data. So this is before they've really entered anything post-secondary at this point, what, whatever their plans are. The question really becomes a year out, two years out, five years out. How is how is their perception on some of this stuff really changed in terms of do I really now do I think that my high school has prepared me now that I've experienced life a little bit? That really becomes the critical question, and that's really where our data needs to focus on beyond that. So there is some data here that we can use in terms of how they felt <coughs> right after they graduated. But the bigger question becomes is once they've experienced life, how are they feeling about it now? And what implications does that have for us moving forward in terms of how prepared they are um, for whatever their choices are, whether it's military, career, college. 
So there is some data that's there. We're hoping to get it a little bit more tighter um, in terms of looking at that. It would give us some baseline data to compare from year to year to what our graduates are thinking. It's a start. It's nothing that right now, I mean, you can see the variance in terms of standard deviation on some of the data. I don't know that it's significant statistically right now, but um, I mean, nobody rates us poorly. I mean, our averages are, for the most part, very positive from our graduates. What about the 16 and 17 data? We don't have, we've not been given any current data from this past year. And what about 16? I didn't, I, you have to go through and you have to turn everything into a PDF once they're there. And so I just went through and gave some samples. All the questions each year are the same, very similar to um, the survey that they do for uh, the referendum. It's their <coughs> hand questions because then they're using it to, you know, Part of the decision would be, do you want to move forward with those same canned questions, or are there other questions that we're interested in? So for, I think we have classes of 24 to 15 in there, and what the question to school perceptions is, can we get the raw data? Because otherwise we have all these PDFs that really aren't very, I mean, they're, so that was the question, John, in terms of, was Jacob's class of 2014 the first one that we had given? No, we have asked, I think, um, I think it started when my first year as principal, so I think back to 12. So we're hoping to get 12 through 17 that we just finished in some Excel data that we can actually provide and it'll be a lot easier to look at than all of these separate PDFs. So we sort of stopped that, but I did want to provide so you could at least see the types of questions that we were asking, but in terms of true data, um, and again, it, it's a great starting point. It doesn't probably give us the really important data questions that we ask after that. So, um, so I think this gives us part of what I had requested to see what kind of questions we ask them. Um, I, as you know, I'd still like to see mm -hmm. the yep. the 16 and 17 results, yep. and it might be useful to know if we're. I mean, you know, we see um, some of these results here. We can know if we're doing, in a sense, better. If we track from year to year and see how the responses shift yep. if they yep. if they shift. So we can't we can't really do that with just correct. And so once we recognize that, and Jackie said too, it is a very tedious process to log in each time to get a question report like that. So it's. It's, it's just to give us a look so you can start to wrap your minds around Because I think before people didn't even have any idea of what questions we were right. asking them. Now we have this, but the true data is yet coming. So it's not a decision-making thing here, but, and I think to Jackie's point, we were talking about it because we are you know, paying for the service. The question is, can we get the same data ourselves without having, and have access to our own data a lot quicker, faster, and ask questions that are less canned and maybe get to, if we realize like these aren't really the questions we want to ask them, we might, so we might have some more flexibility moving forward in terms of, um, you know, if it's SurveyMonkey or whatever we decide to use, we might have that. But we don't want to lose the data we've already uh, uh, created. So is Correct. there a problem with getting the raw data from? That's the question we have posed to them right now. We're waiting to hear back. Okay. So, yeah. Was there, just out of curiosity, I know it's not in here, was there any sort of, at the end of the survey, a feel free to add comments section or anything like that? start thanks thank you so um, 6c is graduation <coughs> venue. so we had had this uh, conversation it was asked to and so we've done a little bit of preliminary research and I think Todd has has got some information I know I've asked Charlie to look at some of that um, where we're at so I think the question really was about initially like have we looked at Falcon Field what does that look like have we looked at other venues and so I'm going to let them, we haven't made any decisions clearly, but what I would say is that if there's going to be a change in venue, that potentially might mean a change in date or, or time of the day or whatever. We need to make that very soon because families would be planning for whatever that looks like. So Todd, I'm going to start with you in terms of Falcon Field stuff and stuff that you've done. I know you don't have all the costs and pieces of that, but maybe just share what you've found out up until this point. Right, so as far as doing it down on the Falcon Field, our concern with that is setting up chairs on Thank you. 
looking at the renting of the cooling unit for the gym. Um, I don't have any numbers back on that yet. There are two <coughs> options with that. One option is just for the day to rent. Uh, the second option is something that might be suited for three or four months out of the year when we actually need it in the gym. Um, so those options are out there. I'm working on getting cost back for each of those. That's pretty much what I have right now. Anything to add, Charlie? I know that we were looking at pricing potential of other venues, but... Yep, so uh, we, we had <coughs> conversations about Miller Park, and they're not easy to get a hold of, especially this time of the year, to find someone who can discuss anything other than buying tickets. Um, but then also, uh, Dave Pentec, uh, Activities Director, and myself also talked about possibly the Milwaukee Theater or some other larger venue um, as well downtown. And so we just got, we've got some calls and feelers out to those locations to kind of start getting some pricing and logistical pieces. Um, some of the larger institutions, you know, MATC, UWM, whatnot, use those venues and kind of get first dibs on when they want, you know, dates and times. <coughs> so in terms of where, what it is, you know, that we're trying to accomplish in terms of that, I know that temperature has been a concern. I mean, I heard that coming into it in terms of that day. Um, I noticed a couple things like seating. It would be nice if there could have been a few more chairs, but that's a simple accomplishment thing. So I guess in terms of where the conversation goes from here, um, you, you know, we're, we're doing some preliminary stuff in terms of that. I think one of the things we talked about that is if we did it at Falcon Field, besides what I think Todd just shared, probably at 1 o'clock in the afternoon is not an optimal time to be holding. <laughs> Um, that ceremony, it would be quite hot with the sun beating down, so you would have to look at changing it probably to an evening time, because um, early in the morning you have the sun in all of everybody's eyes who are in the bleachers. So I think that there would be looking at a time change in terms of that. The other part that when I met with Dave and Charlie, the conversation was is that weekend is state track meet. So in terms of using that weekend and making it a Friday night or even Saturday evening would get a little bit tricky if we had athletes necessarily making a choice next weekend is state softball after that we we're trying to do that yeah and so we were trying to look at you know where you wouldn't have um, athlete competitions in terms of making choices between do I go to my high school graduation ceremony or possibly playing a championship game right so we're looking at some of the options different districts have it some have it on Thursday night some have you there's a lot of different options but I think the decision is sort of comprehensive and I didn't know how much research or where we're going in terms of that or what cost things or so I guess I wanted to have this here to sort of think, you know, to say keep <coughs> researching, bring back, you know, the <coughs> cooling unit, bring back the cost of doing that. Just looking at, you know, what the direction is from here. Any initial thoughts, reactions? Well, if we did have it, say, at 10 a.m. in the gym, I know there has been many, not many, but some student athletes that rushed to get back at 1. So 10 would probably be a problem. If we went with no cooling unit, if we just went, just change the time and... On a Sunday, you mean? Yeah. Oh. I don't think the gradu making it to graduation has been so much of an issue. We excuse them from practice. I, mean, I have never encountered a student who struggled to get there. Even if they were in the, <coughs> the, the very... They, it would be done on Sunday. On Sunday, it would be done. Yep. Yeah. So if, if they are in the state track, Usually they're they're finished about five six o'clock, and it's usually out in on Saturday. On Saturday. Yeah. On Saturday. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Then so we were saying if we went to a Saturday evening, like at six thirty, that would be challenging for them. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that you'd want to go to a Sunday at six thirty because of you know the next day for a lot of people. So, what a lot of them do it Thursday night. So I mean, there's there's a lot of options in terms of what that looks like. So if we went to the cooling unit. <coughs> It would cool it down by one o'clock? The cooling unit would be based on the square footage of the gym. Right. So we would, we would probably rent it the day before, bring it in, get it set up, start it up the day before to cool it, and then let, let it run all day. That's very good. So as far as cooling down that goes, I was, um, I, I know the, the question was uh, the options for the possibility of holding it at Falcon Field. But looking at cooling down the gym, I was recently at a graduation where they had an inflatable ductwork system 
similar to one of the gymnastics centers here, and it worked very well, and it was definitely a retrofit to the, to the facility. So uh, I was uh, going to get contact information and share it with uh, Todd um, if he was curious to, to see what something like that would cost, because we did have uh, some estimates and ideas on how to do a cool down, that, how to permanently put something in from uh, Matt, um, which would be to, to put in some duct work and to swap over from one part of the building to the gym a couple days prior to the uh, to an event that we'd want to make sure it was cool for. So um, I, I'll still get you that stuff just to, so we can look at possibilities and brainstorm. Great, thank you. Okay, so <coughs> keep pursuing different options. I mean, <laughs> I guess <coughs> they want some kind well, of- I think that, I think if we take it to an outside venue, <coughs> say downtown, People are going to be shocked the first year because of the cost of parking and cost of whatever. And just, it, it, but I think if we do something, we need to look at it as that long term. In my opinion, absolutely. Um, I think if we do it here and then we move back and um, and then it costs to rent these facilities, obviously. Mm -hmm. So I think um, I agree to rent a, a, a one day. Cooling unit that probably is the most economically sound decision. However, <coughs> the gym floor for uh, volleyball gets sweated up and is dangerous to student athletes on the court. We've had uh, situations this, this past year that we had to mop down the floor, you know, because we don't have that is climate control. So Todd, you had said something mentioned about getting it longer term too. Right. So I asked for three options. I asked for a day or two rental. I asked for a two to three month rental, which is, could actually potentially turn into a permanent solution with the two or three month rental. It's actually a cooling unit that's brought outside of the building that's on a trailer that's left on site for two or three months but there's actually ductwork installed in the gym that that hooks up to, which is permanent. Which, down the road, if we add another chiller or have other options to permanently cool the gym, then we utilize that ductwork that they put. So I asked for three options. Could, so. could the roof uh, hold, support the weight of a unit, a permanent unit? I don't believe so. Even the permanent option would be on the ground level outside the building. Um, number one, it's easier to service it, and number two, we don't need to worry about structure of the roof. So how long do you think you have a response back with those quotes? Week, two months, weeks? Hopefully in two weeks. So why don't we just put it back on the agenda on the 14th? Um, obviously this will be recorded, so if people have ideas or suggestions on what to do. Um, so it's obviously venue where we keep it here and expand to possibly Falcon Field and the gym and the backup. If we can have a chill and if we look elsewhere larger and then obviously whether we move it to like a Saturday night or keep it Sunday at one. Right? I mean that's yeah, all the right. reason for changing the date would be as if you held it out. Sure. In terms of no, but I'm saying but having yes. those those are mm -hmm. kind of the variables we're looking at right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so on the fourteenth we'll bring it back again and kind of see what we've got so far. All right, thank you. So item seven is items for future consideration. Uh, the spreadsheet's been updated. We covered three of the items that were listed on it tonight. Uh, obviously there's more discussion that's gonna come from it, but we're at least making an effort to get those crossed off, so. Appreciate it. Um, any other items for future consideration? I was surprised it was updated. <laughs> I really was. <laughs> for especially my item. I usually don't get, you know, it usually goes, yeah. I, I looked, because I was gonna get, I was going to have a smart out remark here, and I guess <laughs> I could because it was updated. <laughs> well, I've got to see if you stick to that. <coughs> hey, we, Kathy hey. and I are uh, keeping up with it. <laughs> Very good. We should make sure it's done. So Great job. Go. Any other? Okay. Board member announcements. Anyone? Volleyball started, man. Girls volleyball. Camp this week. Any others? 
Okay. And at 729, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Oh my goodness. And we have 15 seconds to spare.